It's been a long time since Devil May Cry 5 came out, and that's given me plenty of time to think about it. And now that DMC5 Special Edition has been made official, I thought now was the perfect time to release my thoughts into the wild. The Devil May Cry series has had a major impact on my creative and artistic career, so these games are something I think about constantly. I like playing the games, but in the name of being 100% transparent, I think Devil May Cry's story is the best thing it has going for it. Let me rephrase that. The potential for a good story is there, but as we all know, the actual story is pretty bad. Well, that's not right either. The stories are good, but the problem is that those stories just aren't told very well. With the fourth game in the series, Capcom made it explicitly clear that when it comes to DMC, gameplay comes first, which is exactly the way it should be. You should never sacrifice your game's actual mechanics for the sake of the narrative. The DMC games prove without a shadow of a doubt that as long as the game plays well, your plot doesn't need to be perfect or even make sense, or even be somewhat acceptable for a high school level creative writing class. I mean, I don't know why you'd go through all the trouble of creating deep and complex characters with sympathetic motivations if you weren't planning on capitalizing on that, but whatever. Game over story, I get it. So let's talk about Devil May Cry 5 and how well it functions as a game. Let's talk about the core. Let's talk about the heart and soul of the Devil May Cry experience. This game sucks, and everybody who likes this game sucks. I happen to like this game a lot, which would seem to imply that I suck. I also bite, but only if your mother gets on her knees and begs me to. Let's all go to the lobby. Like any good sequel, DMC5 should be a refinement of all the best parts of the previous games, but it's more like a compilation that throws in everything in the kitchen sink, including a lot of the bad stuff. At first glance, DMC5 might appear to be just an expansion pack for Devil May Cry 4, but if you dig a little deeper, you'll discover that that's exactly what it is, actually. You might as well just call it DMC 4.5 instead of a full-blown sequel. This decision is completely baffling to me because every fan of the series I've ever known agrees that DMC 4 was the second most incomplete and unsatisfying entry in the series. After 4 was released, everybody complained about the recycled bosses, the shitty camera system that made platforming sections a nightmare, and this this fucking monstrosity whose only purpose is to string you along and draw the game out as long as possible. In DMC4, the levels were repeated because all the encounters were designed around Nero's Devilbringer, and then Dante was shoveled into the game after the fact. As a result, whenever you play as Dante, he feels like a fish out of water, like he's out of his element, like it's his day off and he's not even supposed to be there today. Why they would use 4 as their frame of reference for a sequel only makes sense if they were trying to prove a point and finish the work they started back in 2008. The good news is, 5 has no recycled levels, but the gameplay is still all kinds of messed up, so none of it makes any goddamn sense. I'm gonna start with Nero. To be clear, Nero's my favorite character to play in DMC4 and 5. Why? Because he's actually fun to play. And unlike Dante, I don't get carpal tunnel when playing as Nero. One of the biggest criticisms about Nero in DMC4 was that his moveset was limited compared to Dante. To literally combat this, director Hideaki Itsuno and his team have worked to increase Nero's potential with the new Devil Breaker system. Not including DLC, Nero can equip eight different robotic arms, each one offering unique ways of altering his moveset. After you purchase some upgrades, you can have up to eight Devil Breakers equipped at once in any combination. There's just one tiny problem. The Devil Breakers are a limited resource. These things earn the name Devil Breaker, too. If you get hit while one is active, they'll do exactly that. Break. Permanently. Or you can press a button to break it on purpose. Now why would anyone want to do that? I'll f***ing tell you why. You can't switch between Devil Breakers whenever you want. No, that'd make too much sense. The only way to switch to a different breaker is to break your current breaker. But you have to go in sequence. So if you have the first breaker of your inventory equipped, but you really want to use the last breaker you're carrying, the only thing you can do is break seven of your breakers to get to it. And you're not getting those breakers back. You broke those broken breakers, and if you want more, you better take your broke ass to the shop and buy some. Or you can walk around a broken city and break your backpick up breakers off the street. Needless to say, this system is, uh, broken. Luckily, devil breakers are completely unnecessary to play the game, which means there's a really easy patch built right in. Don't fucking use them at all. Because inventory management and stockpiling ammunition is the last thing I want out of my Devil May Cry. But by doing that, I also have to acknowledge that trying to diversify Nero's moveset was a completely pointless endeavor, which would imply that this entire game was a waste adventure because too little has been done to set it apart from the last game. Therefore, ergo, Quadrat Demonstratum DMC 4.5. Like I said before, I actually liked playing as Nero in DMC4, so I'm cool with his playstyle being largely unchanged in this game, but even though I'm cool with it, that doesn't mean it's free from issues. Nero's sword, the Red Queen, is an unholy abomination that's been crossbred with a motorcycle. It's also the most badass thing in the history of the universe. Yeah, even more badass than the sword that's an actual motorcycle. The Red Queen has a throttle built into the handle that lets you rev the sword up and increase your attack power. You can do it manually, like a punk-ass little bitch, or if you press the rev button at exactly the right time, you 
get one of these. If your timing is absolutely perfect, all your special attacks get buffed up like somebody laced your steroids with a Charlie Sheen sized crack rock. It's a really cool mechanic when you can pull it off. And the best part about it is that you can rev up every single one of Nero's attacks, meaning it's hypothetically possible for the Red Queen to be supercharged at all times. I say hypothetically because it's not actually possible. Even though the ability has been programmed into the game, each of Nero's attacks have different rev timings, and you gotta be so precise it feels like you have to hit the button on a single frame of animation to get it right. Trying to do that in the middle of combat isn't just difficult, it's inhumane. And what makes this frustrating is that the game offers absolutely no audible or visual cue to let you know when to press the button. The only way to figure it out is through hours upon hours of experimentation. On higher difficulties, you're not supposed to spam the rev button, but that's exactly what I do. Sometimes I get the damage boost and sometimes I don't. At this point, I've just decided to tell myself it's tied to an RNG. Some people might argue that the system wasn't designed for you to rev every single attack. It could be you're only supposed to rev up specific attacks at certain times for maximum effect. Alright, I don't give a shit, fine. But the fact of the matter is there's an ability programmed into the game that even the best players in the world don't have access to, and that don't exactly sit well with me if you smell this complete fucking bullshit. Dante is the other half of the DMC5 equation. Itsuno and friends have definitely solved the problem of Dante feeling like an afterthought like he was in 4. He has all his own levels and boss battles, and nothing is recycled from Nero's campaign. This time, all his bosses and weapons are recycled from 3. Drastic improvement. But he still plays about the same as he did in 4 with some minor tweaks. And that's disappointing for a couple reasons. For one, the transition in Dante's gameplay from the original game to 4 felt like the character was evolving. There's a big difference to how Dante plays in DMC1 compared to how he feels in the third game, and the gameplay transition from that game to 4 was even more significant. So the fact that this Dante feels just like the old Dante with a new coat of paint is a major letdown. Besides that, who the shit thought Dante in 4 was the best the series had to offer? Style switching is the stupidest thing I've ever seen in my entire life. It's ghastly. I hate it. I shoved a watch up my ass as a prisoner of war in Vietnam, and style switching is worse torture than that. Any way you slice it, it's the shittiest gameplay mechanic ever to be implemented in an action game. And if there's any fragile and pathetic fanboys who take issue with that statement, don't forget to hit the like button on your way out. Get the hell out! Get out! Now that that's taken care of, we can finally have a mature and civilized discussion that deeply explores the ins and outs of Devil May Cry's total package, including all the tools that come in the box. That's what she said. <laughs> Style is the name of the game for Dante. That's his trademark. In fact, when the first game was released in Japan, its official genre was marketed as stylish action. After DMC2 crashed and burned and the series needed to be reinvented, DMC3 introduced different styles you could switch between that gave you additional techniques. The catch was you could only equip one style at a time. If you wanted to switch, you had to do it in between missions or at predetermined locations in the levels. Picking a style in DMC3 was a lot like selecting a character in a fighting game. Whichever one you chose determined how you'd play the game. And as you used a particular style, it would level up, rewarding you for sticking with just one by giving you new abilities. And then I don't know who it was, but some friggin' genius thought it would be a good idea if you were able to switch between styles on the fly with the press of a button. And that's exactly what they did in DMC4, which is why 3 is still the best game in the series. In DMC4 and 5, you switch between four different styles by pressing each of the buttons on the D-pad. Swordmaster and Gunslinger turn you into just what the name implies, Trickster gives you more mobility options, and Royal Guard is just stupid as hell. If you never played these games before, let me break down the controls and explain how unnecessarily complicated this system was. In the original Devil May Cry on PS2, X was jump, square was shoot, and triangle was slice and dice. And then the problems began in DMC3. All because of this button right here. The style button. What the style button does obviously depends on what style you have selected, but basically all it does is an enhanced version of actions that you already have buttons for. Square is shoot, right? But with Gunslinger, press circle to shoot a lot. Tired of this boring ass sword animation? Switch to Swordmaster, then press circle to sword like a freak in the bed. Normally, you can press the X button to jump towards and away from enemies, and you can even use it to dodge. But you see this weak ass fucking roll? You're not gonna avoid no damage with this garbage. Switch to Trickster and press circle to dash around the level like a coked up Zabuma fool. <laughs> In DMC 4 and 5, playing as Dante at a high level requires you to rapidly switch between these styles during combat. But because there's no effective way for your thumb to manipulate both the analog stick and the D-pad at the same time, the best DMC players on YouTube have taken to utilizing this hideous claw grip that's guaranteed to give you arthritis by the time you're 35. 
Like I said, the actions for everything you can do with the style button already exist, so there's absolutely no reason to have a redundant button that does an enhanced version of the thing. Instead of switching styles, it would make way more sense to have a button that modifies jump, shoot, and slash when you held it down. The obvious choice for this modifier is the lock on button, which just so happens to have been the button used to modify sword and jump animation since the very first game in the series. Oh, but what about Royal Guard? How do you solve that? Easy. Just make circle the block button. And that way you demonstrate through the game's mechanics that Dante's become a more effective devil hunter, because he wouldn't need to change his entire mindset to access certain moves. Instead, it would show that Dante had perfected each style to the point where he was able to unify four seemingly unrelated disciplines into a unique martial art designed specifically to fight demons. And he would call it Jeet Kune Dante. Be formless, shapeless, like water. Now water can flow, or it can crash. Be water, my friend. Interestingly enough, it turns out DMC5 already implemented this system and nobody realized it. In DMC 3, 4, and 5, you can do a move called Aerial Rave with Dante's keepsake sword, the Rebellion. To do it, you have to switch to Swordmaster and press the Style button in midair. In DMC 5, though, Dante gets a new sword named after himself. Guess how you do Aerial Rave with this new sword? Guess. You just jump in the air and press the regular ass sword button. And this is regardless of what style you're currently using. So now you can do aerial rave while using gunslinger, trickster, or stupid ass royal guard, which you weren't able to do previously. So what does the style button do when you have this new sword equipped and you're using Swordmaster? You're never gonna believe it. You know that DMC reboot that all the whiny fanboys hated? It literally replicates one of the weapons from that game. And these spinny lightsaber things are the exact same as the summon swords ability that Nero and Virgil shoot with the square button, so again, there's no reason to use the circle button for this. Basically, new legendary devil sword, devil sword Dante, featuring Dante from the Devil May Cry series, is the game saying directly to your face that style switching is a stupid idea. Mind you, this sword represents Dante's ultimate form. In other words, Dante is at his most powerful when style switching is made obsolete. Have, have I lost my mind? Be honest with me. Am I talking crazy? I just... I, I just... I need someone to tell me it's okay. I've been keeping this inside for so long and I just can't do it anymore. Huh? Ah, no, no. へえ、まだ生きてたのか。知らんかったよ。いやいや、違うよ。その分は俺の責任じゃねえよ。生き残りが俺の目標とは関係ない。何それ。家から心配すんなよ。ああ。うん。じゃな。バカ野郎が。
This is Lifeline for the PS2. It's kinda like a survival horror game, but you play as an operator in a control room viewing the protagonist through security cameras. Your only means of getting the protagonist from point A to point B is by giving her voice commands, and the result is funny as shit. There is a yellow chip by the lamp. Would you please take it? What? Why did you shoot the bed? You're not gonna do it, are you? Dispenser. Which dispenser do you mean? The one on the right. Leave the room? Okay. No! No! Yes. What the- Dude, what the fuck? The original version of République had the same premise, only without the infuriating voice controls. That's a fun word to say. République! Oh, oh, oh. Pavilion is a really interesting game that was actually advertised as a fourth person game, but the term was just used for underhanded marketing purposes. It actually wound up being possibly the best example of a second person game. I highly recommend playing exactly 30 minutes of it. Okay, so now that everybody understands what a second person game is, imagine you took one of those games and pulled the camera back, thus switching from a first person camera to a third Third person camera. Now imagine controlling this character while trying to issue commands to an AI controlled NPC, and boom, that's a fourth person game. You see, V's weapons aren't a weak ass sword or a gun like the garbage Nero and Dante used, no! Griffin and Shadow are actual living creatures, and one of them even talks to you. But V doesn't control his weapons directly, he just gives them helpful suggestions, and then they just. They just do the best they can, bless their little hearts. It reminds me a lot of the Dogbird Monkey in The Last Guardian. You don't actually attack enemies directly, you just point at enemies and tell one of your minions to do it for you. Amazingly, DMC5 isn't the first fourth perf- The fourth perf- Fuck. There have actually been countless games like this before. Personally, I would classify any game that has you press a button to sick a dog on an enemy to have fourth person mechanics. Yeah, I know that's a weak example, but there are still tons of other games that revolve around the idea of commanding NPCs to do all the heavy lifting for you. Pikmin and Overlord are two examples that stand out off the top of my head. Now, considering all the examples Itsuno's team could have used as research while DMC5 was being developed, how did they fuck it up this bad? Here's Dante, right? In every game where you play as him, if you lock on, hold the analog stick away from the direction you're facing and attack, you'll do something like this. Hold the stick in the same direction to hit him with the stabby stabby bobabby. V can do variations of these same moves, except you have to move the analog stick relative to the direction your demonic pets are facing. If you think that sounds like bullshit, you're wrong. It's not. No. The fact that your weapons have health bars? The fact that your weapons can die, leaving you completely defenseless until they respawn off a cooldown? Now that is some pure, organic, unfiltered horse booty extract. And it's fresh, too. I'm talking farm to fork. Straight from the horse's ass, directly into your face, every time I'm forced to play as V. Honestly though, I could forgive how shitty it is to play as V, cause like I said, I have to give Capcom props for attempting to make breakthroughs in the fourth person action genre, although I think it's kinda hilarious that a few months after DMC5 came out, Platinum Games was like, no you stupid pack of fart sniffing monkeys, this is how you do it. It would have been possible for me to forgive being forced to play as V, but the fact that he exists at all throws such a massive wrench into the system that it's impossible to ignore. That is gonna have to come later though. For now I'm gonna do more of what I do best, nitpick. All of this is gonna come across as just misguided complaining, and that's a fair criticism. Yeah, these are super minor gripes, but think of it like this. If you're having lunch in the park and a couple flies start hovering around your peanut butter and spaghetti crab cakes, no big deal. But if you start getting swarmed by flies and one of them lands in your blueberry stroganoff, now somebody has to die. The point is, minor gripes can stack on top of each other to form one gigantic super gripe, like Voltron. So even if these are just small annoyances that 90% of people don't care about, there are still things that I noticed, and I think it's important to call attention to even the smallest issues for two reasons. For one, they can help people understand how much effort it takes to turn a good game into a great game. Secondly, identifying these issues now allows us to start coming up with solutions that will only make future games better. Actually, there's a third reason for all of this, and that's just me needing to vent for a while. Hopefully, me putting my thoughts out into the universe will help me come to terms with the fact that this game that I waited 11 years for wasn't the life-changing experience that I hoped it would be. Let's start with the sound design. For the most part, the audio quality in DMC5 is perfectly adequate. There are just a couple decisions that were made that made me scratch my head. The most egregious of these decisions was this. Just listen. Yeah, they, uh, they changed the sound of Dante's guns. I don't know why they would change it when the original sound effect for Ebony and Ivory was one of the greatest gunshot sounds in history, but they did. Not the first time this has happened, in fact. You know what other game changed the sound of Dante's guns? Exactly. 
After all these years, there's a lot of implications that come with changing the sound of Ebony and Ivory. If they had established that the new gunsmith character, Nico, had developed a more powerful ammo type, I would have totally bought into that. But you can't just change the sound effects for essential pieces of the lore for no good reason. When you change something that's been established over multiple entries in a series, the fabric of that world starts to unravel. Changing the sound of Ebony and Ivory made the entire Devil May Cry universe feel less real. And yeah, the series is literally about stuff that doesn't exist. But to make a fictional world believable, you have to establish a consistent rule set so that your audience adapts to how things work in the dimension you've made for them to explore. Sometimes though, the audio quality of the sound effects for a 10 plus year old game are just no good. Maybe the audio had to be compressed because of hardware limitations or something like that. Putting low fidelity sound effects in your big budget AAA game is the absolute last thing you want to do. In situations like that, you want to start with the original sound and then layer more gooder sounds on top of it. Let me demonstrate how important it is for sound effects to stay consistent. I'm going to play a clip from an extremely popular game, but I'm going to change one of that game's most iconic sounds. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you're going to notice it immediately because your brain is going to start hemorrhaging internally. Okay, you ready? Here we go. I'm okay. You might be thinking Halo isn't the best example because the gun sounds are completely inconsistent throughout the series. And that's true, but that inconsistency is justified in the lore because all the human weapons have unique model numbers. So if the pistol in Halo 2 sounds different than the way it did in 3, that makes perfect sense because they're actually different variations of the same weapon. That is some absolutely brilliant world building. DMC5 just needed that teeny weeny bit of attention to detail, and not only would I not be complaining right now, I would have praised the game for naturally merging its sound design with its narrative. As we all know, nobody at Capcom seems to give a shit about Devil May Cry's story, but at least somebody on the DMC team understands how important sound is to the overall gameplay experience. The decision to have elements of the battle music come in as your style rank increases was a genius move. This is such a good idea, it needs to be the industry standard. Maybe that would increase the chances of the same system being put in a game with good music. You know, music that doesn't make me sick to my stomach? Cause the music in this game sucks like a vacuum. More like dirt devil may cry, right? Heh. <laughs> yeah. This goes back to keeping things consistent across a franchise. The music in a game is so much more than something that plays in the background. A good theme song should establish the tone of the gameplay experience, and it should also give you a window into the personality of the character you're playing as. Nero's theme Devil Trigger almost gets there. If you look at the actual lyrics, it tells this really tragic story about Nero feeling guilty for not being able to save his surrogate brother Kratos, and because he blames himself for that even though he knows it's not his fault, his mind is being pulled in opposite directions. And because he doesn't know how to reconcile these conflicting ideas, he gets frustrated to the point where the only way he can process his past trauma is through rage. That is some good ass shit. But it's impossible to feel those same emotions that Nero's going through when you listen to this song. Why? Because it's in a fucking major scale. It's like how most people think Hey Ya is just a fun happy dance track, but it's actually about people who stay in toxic unhealthy relationships because of pressure from society. And the funny part is Andre 3000 literally tells people they're being duped right to their face when he says y'all don't want to hear me, you just want to dance. I'm not saying Devil Trigger's a bad song. I mean, I wouldn't listen to it unless somebody had a gun to my head with their finger on an actual trigger, but it's fine, I guess. I just don't think an EDM anthem was the right genre to convey Nero's mindset. Again, it's a matter of consistency. The battle themes for the other one and a half characters in this game are such a gigantic departure from the music in the previous games that DMC5 feels like it's meant to take place in an alternate timeline. Wait a second. I'm gonna come back to that. Whether you thought the music in the previous Devil May Cry games was any good, you can't deny the soundtrack to those games felt 100% unique to that series. I have no idea what genre you would even call it. Some people think it's industrial metal, but that's an oversimplification. How the hell ever, since industrial metal is the fusion of two things you think wouldn't mix, heavy metal and electronica, it's perfect for Devil May Cry, cause Dante, Virgil, and Nero are themselves the unlikely fusion of a human and a demon. In the end, I don't think it matters what genre it actually is, cause this particular sound is exclusive to Devil May Cry, so in a way the soundtracks of previous Devil May Cry's were in their own genre. DMC5 soundtrack is a different story. I can tell you exactly what genre this is. Noise. It's just noise. Especially V's theme. Oh god damn it, kill me two times! If you never heard it before, I'm gonna play a couple seconds for you, but any more than that would be a war crime. Don't say I didn't warn you. Okay, good luck. I swear, I swear to all the gods, that's exactly what it sounds like. I'm not kidding. Listening to this garbage doesn't make me want to kill demons, it makes me want to stab myself in the- Oh. Okay. Huh. 
So, I guess the music in this game really does give you a window into the personalities of its characters. So now I'm going to talk about visuals, but first I want to clarify how I personally distinguish between a game's art style, its graphics, and its animation. A game's art style is made up of all the decisions that the lead director and the art team made when they were figuring out how the game should look. Some of the best games take inspiration from an actual artistic movement to maintain visual consistency throughout the experience. There's that word again, consistency. Good examples include the 1950s Art Deco aesthetic in the original Bioshock, the 15th century Renaissance art motif in Deus Ex Human Revolution, and the high contrast, high saturation minimalism of Mirror's Edge. When I say graphics, I'm talking about the rendering technology that allows the game to look like its concept art. That's stuff like polygon count, texture resolution, and it also includes all the biffs and whiffles you see in the graphics settings like anti-aliasing, subsurface scattering, ray tracing, and all the other reasons why I'm selling a kidney on the black market to buy a 3090. Animation is the third piece of the puzzle. It should be pretty self-explanatory, but it's important to note that good animation is dependent on the game's frame rate, which is actually an aspect of the game's graphics. A game could have the best animation in the world, but if the engine hasn't been optimized and the frame rate is choppy, then it's all for nothing. That doesn't just apply to animation either. All the visual elements of a game work together to create something that looks good in motion. The way a game's art style, graphics, and animation harmonize with each other creates what I refer to collectively as the visuals. It's not the proper technical term or anything like that, but it's simple and easy enough to understand for the purposes of this video. And I think it's important to distinguish between these three things, because it's possible for everything to be damn near perfect, but if one of the visual elements in a game isn't at the same level of everything else, well, it might not be the end of the world, but you're definitely gonna notice. There's a saying in Japanese that I hate that goes, it's the nail that sticks out that gets hammered down. And that brings me to Devil May Cry 5. DMC5 has amazing graphics, but it's got a shitty art style, and the animation leaves a hell of a lot to be desired. DMC5 was built using Capcom's own RE engine, and I guess it's pronounced re-engine because it's short for Reach for the Moon, not Resident Evil like I thought. <coughs> The re-engine is based around 3D scanning real-life objects into a game. Doing this lets your game look photorealistic while also cutting down on modeling time. Photorealism makes perfect sense for a game like Resident Evil, since in those games you're supposed to be a regular-ass human with regular-ass human abilities. And the events taking place in the game are supposed to feel like something crazy is happening in the real world, so an art style that mimics real life is exactly what you want. The fucking mundanity of your protagonist is exacerbated by the realistic presentation, okay? Big word, so it's gotta be true. But the Resident Evil games have always strived to make their visuals as close to the real world as possible. Look at the back of the box for the GameCube remake and it's right there as one of the selling points. The most terrifying, realistic video game ever created. So there's a precedent for Resident Evil's use of photorealism. Even though the first DMC originally began development as a Resident Evil game, it deviated so much from the formula that Shinji Mikami decided it should be turned into its own thing. And thanks to that decision, the world of Devil May Cry was familiar, but at the same time the environments were these cool, magical places that you wanted to explore and learn about. That's why the castle on Malay Island is such a work of art. Unlike what you'd expect to see from a normal castle with perfectly aligned bricks and 90 degree walls, the features of that building were warped and twisted into curved organic shapes that sold the idea that the castle itself was possessed by a demon, and if you weren't careful, it would consume you. Spooky. The series eventually began to verge away from its survival horror beginnings, but the environments in 3 and 4 were still unlike anything that existed on Earth. You ever just walk around DMC4 and admire how beautiful Fortuna City is? It can't just be me. Just look at all this friggin' prettifulness! DMC5 and the re-engine in general gets massive props for avoiding the uncanny valley. The faces in this game don't even get close to making me want to cut my own eyes out, unlike a ton of other games. Ugh. Oh. As good as the faces look though, the levels in DMC5 are just meh. It's just London. I have as much incentive to explore this place as I did the getaway back in 2002. None. It's not that the environments are poorly designed, they're just boring as hell. You run through city ruins for about half the game and that kinda ruins the game for me. I'm not a fan of ruins. I like my city's lively. Yeah man, you and me both. The other half of the game is spent climbing a tree. What, you think I'm joking? I am, because sometimes you run down the tree in order to go back up the tree. As you can imagine, all the later levels look the same, and despite the fact that they're supposed to be these fantastical, otherworldly places, they're somehow even more boring than the London garbage. At the end of the day, I don't think the art style in DMC5 is terrible, I just don't think photorealism works for this particular series. I don't have a good reason for feeling that way either, aside from personal preference. One of the reasons why I got into the series in the first place was because it was heavily influenced by Animu and Mango sensibilities, and it wore that influence on its sleeve. Dante's character design and a lot of his personality, for example, were based on the protagonist from Space Adventure Cobra. And Virgil is straight up king of the weeaboos, right? So 
So for me personally, the paradigm shift from weeb trash to Michael Bay was an unwelcome one. I just feel like if Devil May Cry is going to be marketed as a stylish action game, its visual should be more stylized. Obviously the switch to a more realistic art style was done because the re-engine allowed them to get the best possible looking game with the least amount of resources. I get that. There was no guarantee this game was going to sell, so stuff had to be cut to keep the financial risk to a minimum. That's just the way game making go. But there were several odd choices made in DMC5 that are actually wrong, causing valuable time and resources to be diverted away from the things that needed the most attention and put into things that break the lore. The most heinous crime is what they did to Dante's twin brother Virgil. The key word there is twin brother. Dante and Virgil are identical twins, and this fact was established in the very first game. Wanna hear a joke? How do you make a 3D model of Virgil? You don't. You make a model of Dante, then copy and paste. Psych, that's not a joke. That's actually how you do it. <laughs> All the characters in Devil May Cry 5 are 3D scans of real people, right? Here's the guy Capcom got to play Dante. And here's the imposter that plays Virgil. It doesn't make any sense why they would hire a different face model and spend all those resources on a new art asset when all that was needed was a bit of the old Control-C, Control-V. There's a bit more to it than that, but you get the point. Somebody actually asked Itsuno about this on a stream, and he gave two reasons for the change. The first reason was that Dante and Virgil were made identical because of budget and time constraints back in the days of the PS2. <laughs> Bullshit! So when they were thinking about what they could accomplish with the re-engine, they realized that identical twins are rarely 100% identical. Which is true, but there's no such thing as identical twins that don't look alike. Yeah, there are subtle differences, but not to this extent. The second reason Itsuno gave was even dumber. Apparently Virgil spent so much time in the demon world that the bones of his face were rearranged, and that's why he looks different. I'm serious, he actually said that. But it was obviously one of those half-assed answers people give when they have no idea what they're talking about. You know, like doing a sixth grade book report in front of the class when all you've read is the cover. I get to the <laughs> That's not the only nonsensical decision they made with this game though. When they updated all the weapons for the new generation, they didn't just keep the same designs and up the poly count. Every single weapon was rebuilt from scratch for DMC5, and the justification for this was that the model they used for the Sparta Sword in DMC4 was the same model they used in the PS2 games. So all the weapons needed to be overhauled for modern day hardware. Everything except Dante's trademark handguns. Ebony and Ivory are actually the only weapons whose design remained constant throughout the entire series. In DMC5 though, they actually ran spellcheck on the engraving on the side. For almost 20 years, the guns were signed for Tony Redgrave by 45 Artworks, because English education in Japan is an atrocity. Not anymore! As far as retcons go, this is one I'm actually on board with. You want to talk problematic retcons, that award goes to whatever the hell they did to the Rebellion. In DMC3, the Rebellion's first chronological appearance, it starts off looking like this. After Virgil uses the sword to pin the tail on the Dante, it awakens. Hence, Dante's awakening. Several components of the sword open up, including the bones on the side that form the crossguard. This design continued on through the animated series in DMC4 because consistency used to mean something 10 years ago. With this new design, there's no way the crossguard could have opened up the way the original did, and that makes me think whoever redesigned the Rebellion either forgot how it was supposed to work or they just didn't care. I mean, I guess it doesn't matter, since it gets destroyed, then Dante eats the damn thing and now it's gone forever, but that's not the point. Maybe I'm the only one who even noticed these microscopic details. Maybe I'm the only one who even cares about this stuff in the first place. Who knows? The fact of the matter is, I do care about it, and it's very clear to me that the people making these games don't hold the series with as much reverence as I do. It's heartbreaking, but at the same time, it's eye-opening in a lot of ways. I know for a fact I'm not the only one who feels this way, but I also realize that people who think like me are an extremely small subset of the fan base. The majority of Devil May Cry fans don't give 3 sixteenths of a rat's ass that Dante has cuts and bruises on his face when he's previously been shown to heal instantly after being impaled. The general populace doesn't care about any of this stuff, but that's exactly who Capcom has to market this game to in order to make their money back. As we all know, the general populace is comprised entirely of dumbasses, so as long as a bunch of dumbasses are Devil May Cry's target demographic, I think it's about time I stop putting so much thought into a game that hasn't been made for me since 2005. But not before I talk shit about this game's garbage ass animation! <laughs> I'm exaggerating, obviously. The animation isn't entirely garbage, it's more like a mixed bag. Most of it's great, and that's what makes the mediocre stuff look worse. But if they spent less time remaking stuff that didn't need remaking and focused on more important things, some of the animations would have wound up better than they are now. One of the reasons why I like playing as Nero is because unlike Dante, every move Nero makes is packed with raw kinetic energy. Nero's animations have this weight and heft to them that's both graceful and brutally violent at the same time. Nero's fighting style is also one of the most badass things on the planet. Dude friggin' lights his sword on fire and then digs into the ground when he attacks, and that sends burning chunks of asphalt and gravel blasting into the air like rocket-powered shrapnel. Like, are you fucking kidding me? That's sick as shit! 
Dante's moves just don't pack the same punch. Even though he technically does more damage per second, his attacks feel weaker because the animations don't sell it. Look at Nero's attacks in slow motion. Notice the wind-up time before he swings his sword and the time it takes him to recover in between each swing. There are two important principles of animation on display here. The first is anticipation. That's when a character essentially warns you they're about to do something through their movement, and that makes the resulting action feel more powerful. Before he swings his sword, notice how the male reaches back like a pimp in order to slap the hoe. The way Nero leans back and throws his arm up to counterbalance the sword prepares your mind for what follows. Jolly good, I say. The second important animation principle is slow in, slow out, which if you ask me is actually way kinkier than it sounds. The way it works is basically Newton's first law. Objects at rest stay at rest, and objects in motion stay in motion unless acted on by an outside force. Going back to Nero, he demonstrates how much the Red Queen weighs because you can see how much effort he has to put in to slow the damn thing down. By comparison, Dante's attacks don't sell me on the idea that he's even trying. And I get the idea that one aspect of Dante's character is that he's supposed to make it look completely effortless. But the way his attacks start and stop on a dime, it looks robotic, like Mr. Zed here. And because Dante's attacks don't look like they obey the laws of physics, they feel weak. And yeah, I'm aware of how ridiculous it is to expect a game about a superpowered demi-demon to follow the laws of physics, but I've said it before and I'll say it again, when you're creating a fictional world, your job is to take the absurd and the impossible and make your audience think it could happen. Okay, last nitpick and I'm done, I swear. Rainstorm. What the hell is this? What. The. Hell. Is. This. You know goddamn well this is unacceptable, Capcom. Don't let it happen again. 